Welcome, Age of Vintage Society. Christopher Plummer was one of the most distinguished actors to have graced the big screen. Regarded as one of the most brilliant Canadian actors of his generation, Oscar winner Christopher Plummer played Captain Von Trapp in the 1965 movie The Sound of Music, among dozens of other projects. Why was Christopher Plummer threatened by a $2 million lawsuit? Make sure to watch the video until the end and leave your thoughts in the comments. If you are new here, join our wonderful community by subscribing to the Age of Vintage channel. Arguably the greatest survivor of the two-fisted drinkers school of acting that included the likes of Richard Burton, Peter O'Toole and Albert Finney, classically trained actor Christopher Plummer established himself on both sides of the Atlantic as one of the finest stage performers of his generation, particularly in Shakespearean roles. His portrayals of Hamlet, Iago, King Lear and King Henry, among other roles in the UK in the 1960s, helped him become well known and acclaimed per the Washington Post. It was his role as Captain Von Trapp in the classic 1965 blockbuster The Sound of Music, however, that transitioned him into a household name. Christopher Plummer would rather fans forget his famous role as the stoic head of the Von Trapp family. That guy was a real bore compared to the real-life Christopher Plummer, a self-proclaimed boozer and serial womanizer. If anyone thought Plummer was the male version of his saintly co-star Julie Andrews. Along with becoming the oldest person to win an Oscar, Plummer also won a pair of Emmys and two Tonys during a nearly 70-year career. He was an infamous temper and had to wait nearly half a century for his Oscar. Plummer was a multi-hyphenate performer whose career spanned decades, earning him awards across multiple mediums. With only a Grammy standing between him and an EGOT, Plummer received an Oscar for Best Supporting Actor for his role in 2010's Beginners. He was nominated for seven Emmys and won two, one for Arthur Haley's The Money Changers and another for his voiceover work on Madeline. His first Tony arrived for his leading role in Serrano, and he received a second for his performance in Barrymore. Christopher Plummer was perhaps the most underrated of the superstars of his generation, which included the likes of Paul Newman, Robert Redford, Sean Connery, Michael Caine, Donald Sutherland, Peter O'Toole, Richard Burton and Jason Robards, among others. Yet he had one of the longest careers, winning accolades for his performances on the silver screen, television and the stage. Christopher Plummer was born on December 13, 1929 to Isabella Mary and John Orme Plummer in Toronto, Ontario. His mother was related to the Canadian Prime Minister, Sir John Abbott. Plummer's parents divorced the same year he was born. Plummer says he has no memory of any interaction with his parents during his formative years. This might explain the outrageous off-the-leash behaviour that came to typify his private life. Having gone to live with his mother in Montreal, the young lad discovered the theatre at a young age, taking in various stage productions, ballet and opera throughout his youth. Plummer wished to become a pianist and started studying it formally. However, he soon discovered the world of theatre and decided to plunge into acting. He attended the High School of Montreal and later McGill University, where he dedicated time to acting. Following high school, he trained with the Canadian Repertory Theatre in Ottawa, where he was in countless productions in a mere two years, including The Infernal Machine, which also featured a young William Shatner and Cymbeline. Though he made his small screen debut in a televised production of Othello, Plummer spent most of the decade honing his chops on the stage. In 1954, after studying acting and booking some minor roles, Plummer finally got his big break on Broadway. The play was The Star-Crossed Story, and it ran for, drumroll please, exactly one night. In a scandalous twist, it wasn't the negative reviews that closed the show, but a darker reason. It turned out that the entire play had been plagiarised, leading the production to immediately shut down but this wasn't going to be Plummer's only light on Broadway. His next performance in Home is the Hero was more successful and stretched to 30 performances. On American television, Plummer appeared in Craft Theatre, productions of The Light That Failed and The Web. 
while playing Miles Hendon in the adaptation of Mark Twain's novel The Prince and the Pauper, following Hallmark Hall of Fame productions of Johnny Belinda and Little Moon of Alban, Sidney Lumet's remake of Zoe Atkins, 1933 stage play Morning Glory. In an attempt to settle down in 1956, Plummer married Tammy Grimes, who, besides being a Tony Award-winning actress, was known for having a voice that sounded like a buzzsaw. I'm not sure what her voice did for their marriage, but it didn't stop them from quickly having a child together. It may also have been responsible for a rather rude early departure by Plummer. Here's what makes Plummer's quick exit from his marriage to Grimes even worse. Some sources report that their baby's impending arrival was the only reason that Plummer and Grimes even got married in the first place. Something tells me this marriage might not work out in the long run. By 1960, Plummer and Grimes had drifted apart and were soon courting other possibilities. Plummer dated entertainment journalist Patricia Lewis and their romance started with quite a bang. Well, more like a crash and one that occurred right in front of Buckingham Palace, no less. Lewis crashed her car with Plummer in the passenger seat, and the consequences were disastrous. While Plummer was mercifully unharmed by the accident, Lewis wasn't so lucky. She injured her jaw and fell into a dangerous coma. Doctors didn't think she would wake up, but thankfully they were wrong. After a few terrifying months, Lewis regained consciousness. Plummer, despite his already present womanizer reputation, had stayed by her side throughout the ordeal. Lewis was recovering from the car accident when Plummer asked for her hand in marriage. At the ceremony, Lewis was fresh out of a coma, her jaw hadn't healed, and her hair was still growing in from surgery. Let's just say she didn't make the cover of today's bride. Plummer, now happily married, spent the next few years building an impressive stage and film career. His film career began in 1958 when Sidney Lumet offered him a decent part opposite Henry Fonda in Stage Struck. He was never again short of work. Following a strong portrayal of the reckless Emperor Commodus in The Fall of the Roman Empire, Plummer had his great success on the big screen with his performance as the aloof widow Captain Georg von Trapp in The Sound of Music. Starring Julie Andrews as a young nun sent by her convent to be a governess for the numerous Von Trapp children, only to fall in love with the captain, The Sound of Music was a monster hit, an Oscar winner and the last of the old-fashioned Hollywood movies before the more experimental films of the late 1960s and early 1970s. Plummer was a serious actor of Shakespearean quality and he often looked down on Hollywood fluff, he described The Sound of Music as so awful and sentimental and gooey, but not even a huge salary could make Plummer excited about this role. Christopher Plummer always refused to refer to his most famous film by its real title. To him, it was The Sound of Mucus, or S&M, a sly reference to sadomasochism. Yet he will always be first associated with a project about which he was equivocal. He likened it to an albatross around the neck of his incredibly successful and diverse acting career. His dislike for the role was not completely unjustified, for it is unfortunate that a man of Plummer's talent and versatility should be remembered mainly for a single role in a movie that continues to remain a hit even after 55 years. Another reason for Plummer to detest the sound of music was the character he played, Captain Von Trapp. Plummer found the captain one-dimensional and boring. Plummer worked at fleshing out the role, but in the end he still wasn't pleased. Besides this, there was something at the core of the sound of music that Plummer loathed. Actor Christopher Plummer was much more than Captain Von Trapp, the role that he is most identified with. In a remarkable career of over seven decades, his dapper, upper-class screen persona belied the sheer range of his acting abilities and the tremendous subtlety and nuance at his command. Following its release in 1965, Robert Wise's The Sound of Music passed out Gone with the Wind to become the highest grossing film in history. Plummer starred as the stuffy Austrian captain who, as the Germans loomed, allowed Julie Andrews's governess to make a singing troupe of his charming family. While filming for The Sound of Music, Plummer was terrified of having to sing songs. Plummer says he accepted the role of Von Trapp 
only to try out the musical genre for a future project he had in mind. In fact, he claims to have never sung before he got the part, not even in the shower. Maybe a little shower singing might have prevented technicians from having to improve Plummer's performance. Since Plummer had no practice singing, his voice had to be overdubbed in the finished film. Bill Lee stepped in to sing for Plummer. Lee was famous as a Disney stand-in for actors, like Plummer, who didn't have a clue about how to use their voices. But maybe it wasn't Plummer's vocal stylings that got him the part in the first place. Julie Andrews had the starring role as Maria and, though he was loath to admit it, Plummer felt intimidated. Yes, he was a supremely gifted, spectacularly willful actor, utterly confident of his own brilliance. But Miss Andrews was the beloved heroine of Mary Poppins, the woman with the voice of an angel who had triumphed on Broadway and the West End in My Fair Lady too. Plummer, on the other hand, couldn't carry a tune in an alpine rucksack. I was stricken, absolutely terrified, he said, at the prospect of the recording studio. When the producers, 20th Century Fox, asked him to tape a guide track or early versions of the Rodgers and Hammerstein songs to assist with filming the musical scenes, he flatly refused. The actor demanded more time and insisted he would walk off the picture if they made him sing. The film company retaliated by threatening a $2 million lawsuit. Eventually he was flattered into line. Studio chief Richard D. Zanuck visited the set and, in front of the cast, heaped praise on him until he agreed to return. Even then, Plummer despised the part he had been given. Von Trapp was very much a cardboard figure, humorless and one-dimensional, tepid, poor, soft-centred. Most actors would have welcomed the role as their big break, and Plummer, though he spent the 1950s playing supporting roles in TV dramas, had almost no film experience. Most audiences had never heard of him. I was a pampered, arrogant young man, spoiled by too many great theatre roles. Ludicrous though it may seem, I still harboured the old-fashioned stage actor's snobbism toward movie-making. The moment we arrived in Austria to shoot the exteriors, I was determined to present myself as a victim of circumstance. That I was doing the picture under duress, that it had been forced upon me, and that I certainly deserved better. He did add, with more than a hint of pride, that my behaviour was unconscionable. But it was small wonder that he gained a reputation during the making of The Sound of Music, one he never lost, for being a rude, bullying, hard-drinking, priggish, loud-mouthed bore. One morning, badly hungover, he stormed onto the outdoor set and interrupted a take with Maria and the children. He was being grossly insulted, he roared. Everyone on the production was ignorant and disrespectful, and if he didn't receive grovelling apologies from everyone, from the director to the canteen crew, he would quit the picture. A quailing assistant director led Plummer off the set, and begging him to sit on a park bench, asked why he was so angry. In spite of Plummer's newfound fame, one woman stands out as clearly not on Team Plummer. In 1965, he was still married and filming Inside Daisy Clover with Natalie Wood, who was playing a teenaged starlet. Wood brought out Plummer's worst amorous behaviour, which she simply laughed off. But rumours started circulating about Plummer's proclivities, and producers found themselves going to great lengths to keep this now-in-demand actor happy. By 1968, Plummer was divorced from Lewis and still on the prowl. His lecherous reputation preceded him on a shoot in Greece. The film was Oedipus the King, and the producers were prepared for Plummer the Playboy. Waiting for him was a 20-year-old assistant, who Plummer described as having never-ending legs. While filming Lock Up Your Daughters, Plummer locked eyes on co-star Elaine Taylor, who was 11 years his junior. By the next year, Taylor and Plummer were seriously in love and planning a trip down the aisle. Plummer's lifestyle was new and improved, but his over-the-top arrogance stayed intact. Just because acting legend Laurence Olivier was one of Plummer's idols didn't mean he was protected from Plummer's egotism. Before rehearsals for a stage play, Plummer announced that he wouldn't have Olivier as a director because Olivier wasn't good enough. Gradually, the theatre replaced music as the love of his life. 
in what separates the men from the boys, he once said. Throughout his career he was never far from the stage and was, in fact, a greater star of the stage than he was of the screen. He was hailed as one of the finest Shakespearean actors of his time. From 1955, when he appeared on stage as Mark Antony in Julius Caesar at the American Shakespeare Festival Theatre, until the end of his life, Plummer never quite stopped doing Shakespeare roles. In fact, according to reports just before his death, he was preparing to play King Lear on film. Chris was an extraordinary man who deeply loved and respected his profession with great old-fashioned manners, self-deprecating humour and the music of words. He was a national treasure who deeply relished his Canadian roots. Through his art and humanity he touched all of our hearts and his legendary life will endure for all generations to come. He will forever be with us. If you liked this video, don't forget to give it a thumbs up, subscribe if you are new here, and if you want to support my work, please visit my Patreon page. Now it is your turn. What do you think about the life and legacy of Christopher Plummer? Talent combined with a strong personality always creates difficult situations, but over time he realised his mistakes and was undeniably one of the most talented actors.